You did a great job. Hitler made his way to the prepared lectern, signaling the commencement of a speech intended to further solidify the narrative of German triumph. The anticipation in the air was palpable as the crowd fell into hushed expectancy. Children of Germania! Hitler began, his voice resonating through the square, a symphony of malevolence and calculated charisma. Today marks a turning point, a triumph of the Aryan spirit over the forces of Bolshevism. Joseph Burrow, where are you? Uh, Florida. <laughs> Whereabouts in Florida are you? Uh, Fort Myers. We literally had a Category 5 hurricane about two years ago. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, I got a lady, uh, an author in Florida, and she went through that hurricane. They were okay. She's in, well, she, she travels, her biggest city is St. Petersburg. So she's kind of that way in Florida, but that's probably nowhere near you. But to me, it's Florida. <laughs> so yeah, it's as it, close. It's, as... Yeah, it's close. Well, we got the literal landfall of it. Wow. And were you okay? Yeah, I was okay. I was in a shelter to take place, but it was uncomfortable. I'll bet. So did you have to like leave home and, and go to the shelter? Yeah, it was, it wasn't that far away though. How long were you at the shelter? Uh, two, three days, I think. That's pretty serious. But the damage to your home was, was minimal, yeah? It was just the roof. Okay. Just the roof? The roof stayed on? The roof stayed on. It just got damaged. Right. Okay. Not too expensive to fix? Uh, no, it's just waiting for insurance on that one. Yeah, okay, yeah. But insurance is a big, <laughs> it's quite a good business to be in, I would have thought, in a hurricane-affected uh, state. Yeah. So did you grow up in Florida? Uh, yes. So that's where you uh, are? That You are a local? Yeah, so I wasn't born in Florida. I was born abroad on a U.S. military base. Really? Whereabouts? In Japan. Wow. Well, that's interesting. So one of your parents, at least, was in the military. Yes. What branch? Uh, uh, they, they were in the Navy. In the Navy. So you're a military brat. I guess. And I get a lot of the inner branch jokes they give, give out. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what like? Oh, they... they He's Navy, so he always makes he has to always make fun of the Marines. Right, yeah. And the I Marines had, have to make fun of him. Right, yeah. The Marines tend to make fun of uh, all the other services I found the, in the U.S. I had a um, I I have actually he's a friend of mine. He's a, he's a comedian in America, and he was in he'd been in the army, but his father was in the Marines, and he said. Uh, his father would always tell him that army stands for ain't ready for Marines yet. <laughs> Which is one, one of the things they do. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. So that's interesting. So, but being born in Japan, obviously a U.S. citizen, could you claim Japanese citizenship if you wanted it? No, I don't think Japan has that. As okay. Set up as it was on a U.S. military base there. Uh, my mom is from the Philippines. Right. I think I technically could claim that, but I yeah. haven't. Because a friend of mine is Gene Baxter, who was known as Bean, and he was one half of a very famous radio duo in Los Angeles called Kevin and Bean. And Bean was a military brat as well. Um, and, you know, if you meet him, you think he's, he's American, but he's got British citizenship because he was born here because his father was serving here. At the time, and so, and he's actually this week he's on his way back to the UK. He 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 had some family he needed to take care of in uh, New Orleans, so he he went there for a while. But he's back in the UK now, back in London. So he he managed to get British citizenship through birth. So you never know, you could be uh, triple national. You could get US, Philippines, and Japan, maybe. Maybe I I just haven't I, tried. <laughs> I, I'm triple national. I got three passports. I was born in the UK. Um, my parents emigrated to New Zealand, so I took out New Zealand citizenship while I was there. And then my wife, who's a New Zealander, and I 
we moved to Australia together and I took out Australian citizenship. So I've got three passports. So about every three and a half years, I have to update one of my passports. It's not like every 10 years oh. with me. It's because uh, I keep them all up to date because you just never know, especially being in Europe when um, things are getting... Um, bit warm in Ukraine and Putin's using a lot of rhetoric and it might be you know one day we might go you know what Australia New Zealand we might just go there <laughs> till the heat's off but yeah it could give you some options so you grew up in Florida and this book is an alt history book you have a degree in history don't you yes I do and it's a bachelor's degree yeah it's a bachelor's degree it's what just what I was interested in, and I wanted to take those courses. Yeah. Well, I found other books you've done on Amazon, and they're straight history. Why did you decide that The Two Presidents would be an alt history uh, book, a fiction book? Uh, I just kind of had the idea for a story. Uh, it sounds cliche, but it kind of was a dream, technically. Yeah? <laughs> I just kind of wrote from it and decided that to give it a try because I do like other alt history stuff. Yeah. And listen and listen to to that either on YouTube or read the books. Like I know Harry Turtledove is a major alternate history author. Yeah. And you say it was a dream, do you mean it was an ambition or did you literally dream the book? I think I literally dreamed the concept and it just kind of took off from there. Right. So where did it start? Did it start with the bomb? Yeah, it just kind of started with that idea. Yeah. And thinking what would happen if that happened. Uh, the Einstein plotline was just something I thought up that I thought would be interesting. Yeah, I don't want to give too much away because I, I want people to get the book or the audio book, obviously. But in your book, it's set just at the just before and just at the beginning of the Second World War, it starts. But America doesn't get the bomb when America got the bomb in 1945. America, it, the, the, bomb, the bomb comes along earlier in the story, doesn't it? Yeah, it comes a lot earlier. And yes. It, the, the book has an explanation why it came along earlier. Okay, so you're happy to... Because to, to, I, don't, I don't know how much you, you're happy to reveal, and I don't want to reveal too much. Uh, yeah, I'm not going into exact details. Just saying it's explained why. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, and there is a certain time travel aspect to this as well. So it's almost a science fiction as well as a, an alt history, isn't it? Yeah, I think I probably got inspired because I started coming writing it right after I think Oppenheimer came out. Right. So obviously people would be thinking of that. Yes. And That's a good plan for I, marketing. <laughs> yeah. And every every now and then I get um recommendation clips on the movie The Final Countdown, which also involves time travel to World War just before World War II. Yeah, 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 I get that. So having your background in history is why the historic pieces that are in it are so accurate, because you talk about the German-America bomber, which is something the Germans were working on, isn't it? Yeah, it was something they were working on. I know they didn't get far on it, but yeah. it was something they were working on, and I thought it would be... Because... Of us, of the actions taken by the characters, yes, it makes sense they would suddenly pour more into it because they can't do this other thing. Yeah, yeah, and so all of the colonels and the generals and the military people in the book, they are the actual military people that were in charge of various things at the time, aren't they? Yes, I did my best to find out who did it. I even did my best to find out the names of the secretaries for both Roosevelt and Churchill. And yes. What they were called. Oh, so the, those, the, the, you know, to, to use an insulting phrase, the minions who, the, the people who were the assistants and the secretaries to Churchill and co, they were, they were real people as well. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so you can kind of tell if they weren't real ones, if 
for the last real ones, I just didn't mention their names. They're just <laughs> random person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's really good because you've got just enough of the real stuff mixed in with the the stuff that is the alt history stuff. That blend must have been something you you must have worked on to get that ratio just right to make it work. Yeah, it it took a little bit to get it right. It was because I I it, it's somewhat of a fault, I guess. I want to be as accurate as possible, even though I'm telling a fictional story that literally changes everything. Mm -hmm. So I. I, I kind of want the I want the details right, mm -hmm. so that it could be seen as somewhat realistic, even yeah. if it's not the most realistic cause. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. That's a it's a real what if story. When I first started reading it, I mean, it went away from this, but I got the feeling of that show, The Man in the High Castle. Was that an influence for you, the TV series? Uh, not as much because I haven't really seen it, but I've okay. read all about it and read all the lore about it. Yeah, it was just hard for me to get into that. It's set a little bit show. later than where your book is set. Yeah, but it had well, a, it, 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 yeah. It's based off its own book that did its own thing as well. That's right, yeah. different from the show. Yeah, no, yours is better. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I'm not going to get into it with you because yours was better and with most of the characters being real historical characters I mean obviously Roosevelt, Churchill and Hitler but there is a fictitious character Mr. Mason where does he come from? Well since we might already said time travel he is from the future Yes but the idea for that character would, is he based on anybody from history that you admire? Not really. I think I was inspired by various fictional presidents you see in various TV shows. Like, um, I, f I think the number one influence probably might have been, um, I, I forget the actor's name, but from the show, the... Why am I forgetting the name of the show? Could it be the West Wing, yeah. President Bartlett? Partially, I think so. Um, I got yeah, a bit of that from him. That yeah, De designated survivor. I right. Don't know okay. If you saw, saw yeah. That one. I think it was inspired by, partially by him, since he's supposed to be a sort of independent guy fr thrust into the presidency. Yeah, because I got the feeling that Mr. Mason would make a good president. He seemed to be level-headed enough and statesman-like enough, um, you know, as we're in an era now when there is at least one presidential candidate who doesn't come across to me as being that statesman-like. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and Mr. Mason did seem like a guy who you'd think would like, well, yeah, he, he does, does feel like he would be a good fit for president. Yeah, and like all fictional presidents, you have no idea what his party is. <laughs> yes, yeah. And that was deliberate too, so your own political leaning was not affect, didn't didn't affect his character at all then? No, I tried to think of what we do and what if he suddenly found himself in the middle of the of, of Roosevelt's administration. <laughs> Has to, you have to work with what you have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there are some nice twists in the book. Did you plan the whole thing out in advance or did you start writing it and then take the feeling from the characters and the story of where you would like to take it? I kind of did. It, it was like the quote where you can plan stuff and then first contact with whatever it doesn't survive. So I planned something out and then things kind of went off on, a, on their own. Yeah. So being a history buff, that probably was a more efficient way to research this. But I'm, I'm guessing there was quite a bit of research in this to get those the time points that are the real time points that intersect with the old history to make that work. So how long did you, did you take on, on doing all that before you could actually sit down and start writing? Uh, probably... Probably a month. I, I do work somewhat fast, and I am known for that. I 
for being able to work rather fast. So I think it just took me mostly a month and then double checking when, as I wrote it, to make sure right. I remembered correctly. And then once you get down to it, what is your writing process? Do you have a, like a, a quota of words you need to write each day or you know, do you write every day? Do you take time? Or how does that work? Or do you have to be in a cabin in the woods? I mean, what is the process uh, of writing a work like this like for you? Uh, just I write every day um, and right when I suddenly have an idea, I quickly open it and make sure to write it down. <laughs> yeah. And if not, actually write actual dialogue and then going back to see if the idea is there. So does the dialogue come first? No, it, the dialogue comes second. It's okay. more the... Right. Uh, it is the, just the general ideas that come, and I try to think of dialogue to go along with the situation. Right. Now, as a narrator for this one, your book was a dream. In fact, I would go as far as to say that the manuscript you sent me was the best, most user-friendly manuscript I've ever read. And I've done over 200 audiobooks, but yours was the 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 easiest one to work with for turning the work into an audiobook because usually the manuscript i get from the author is literally exactly the same as the print or the kindle book but yours was written more like a screenplay which made it so much easier because you had the character's name and then straight in you know cuz you know often if i'm doing it from from the kindle book script which is the usual way to do it it's got the dialogue followed by the name of the character that just said the line. So I have to read ahead to get the right character, to do the right voice for that character. But yours was written with the character name first and then the dialogue below. Was that, is, is, is that how you always do it when you work with an audio book? Is, or to write a separate script, in effect? Because I've had a look on, on Amazon and the, the I thought, is the whole book written like this maybe? And I had a look this morning and no, it's written just like a regular. If you read the, the print or the Kindle version, you get a book. But the, the, the script I got was, I have to thank you because it was so much easier to do. Why was yeah, that? Uh, uh, well, in addition to history, I minored in cinema studies. And right. I really wanted to do uh, film. I yeah. wasn't as cut out for as I thought. But right. I always did media and stuff before, so yeah. I knew how to write scripts. Yeah, and used to write for like my high school news show as well. Yeah, so I always want to make sure it looks like a script. Yeah, I mean, so you've already, in effect, if you wanted to take this to another medium, you've already done the screenplay. <laughs> it's done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there any plans for that? You're going to pitch it. I've emailed someone about it. They, yeah. they haven't contacted me back yet. Yeah. So I'll, I'll uh, look into that again. Yeah. Well, if you can use the audio book to help you get onto that, you, you've got the audio book there as well to give them an idea of, of what it would sound like, at least. Uh, they'll just have to use their imaginations for what it would look like. So you get the audition. So here's this guy you've never met on the other side of an ocean bit of a leap of faith there to give it to me to do were there any was there any doubt in there uh no i you were technically the second audiobook i worked on i did a test audiobook on one of my short non-fiction ones yes i think he was from the uk you had the ships yeah, yeah. about the ships yeah and but, i heard a little bit of the sample that was quite nice it was nice nicely read yeah it was uh in that one wasn't as difficult to do because that's mostly one voice talking while this one, there's multiple characters. Yeah, this is the first one I've played Hitler. Um, <laughs> I've done Churchill yeah, I, before, but this was the first time I was Hitler. And, and I, it was good go, going, to, you know, at the end of the day, and my wife would say, how, how was your day? And I'd say, it was good, I was Hitler today. <laughs> that yeah, doesn't happen I, every I, day, you know? <laughs> yeah, I figure I'd put a warning in that when I posted the the book for audition there was a <laughs> warning saying warning hitler's a character in this yeah yeah but it was it was fun to do 
especially the the scene where he's at a rally, which meant you know I could put the uh, little bit of echo and reverb on it like he was coming out of a a 1940s PA system, and uh, yeah, uh, it was it was actually trickier to do a more laid back Hitler actually when he was just talking to his aides and stuff in his office because. The traditional view of Hitler and most of the audio of Hitler, if not all of it, is of him ranting at rallies. So that was a little bit easier, actually, than it was thinking, well, how would this guy sound just talking across a desk to someone, even though in most of it he was pretty angry, which did help a little bit. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I know some clips survive of him talking normally. And they're yes. very weird compared to his actual like rounds yeah. and stuff. I listened to one of those when whenever he came up and one of those scenes came up. I found some on YouTube, you're right. There's even a few where they've they've used AI and made him speak English, which is really creepy. Um because he comes across as really sinister in a lot of those and I kind of use the feel of that um t- to do his uh, voice because I had to make him obviously speak English, but I, I wanted to make it obvious that he was German without being offensive to German people, which is always a balance when you do strong accents like that. Um, but yeah, it was interesting uh, to be Hitler. It is uh, it is an amazing book. Um, it's called The Two Presidents. It's an old history that starts just before what we know as the Second World War starts. Don't worry, the Second World War starts... Uh, but it's very different, and there are so many twists in the book along the way. Which one was your favorite, do you think, without giving too much away? Did you have a favorite twist? Because I had a favorite moment with a twist. Uh, I already briefly mentioned it, but I won't say what he does exactly. I incorporated Einstein into as a character in, into yes. this, and I thought his somewhat minor arc was pretty good. <laughs> It was. Uh, and without giving too much away, we know Einstein as a very intellectual man. But in this book, there is a part of Einstein that makes him more human and more flawed, shall we say. And that makes him a bit more emotional than you would expect a man of science to be. I don't. Have I gone far enough there or too far? No, that's that's perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. The book is called The Two Presidents. It's available at audio uh, on sorry, on Audible and iTunes and Amazon of course, and you can get the Kindle version there. Uh in fact, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's a link to um Amazon where you can if you just go to the the bottom there, if you click on it, you'll be able to go there and you'll be able to download the audiobook or the Kindle if you want to do it on Amazon. Uh, where can we find out about uh, more about you, Joseph? Uh, I'm still working. Uh, uh, I'm working on a website. I I probably should have done that first, but I've <laughs> been doing stuff out of order. <laughs> well, there's a bio of you on Amazon, and all the the the, the books you've done. This will be the third one, I think, that's on there. Am I right? Is the because there's the one about the ships, the Olympic one. There's another one. What's the other? Oh, the other one's about uh, the space race, isn't it? Yeah, and um, uh, yeah, the space race. Those are short ones. This one was the first real long one. Yeah, and I'm working on some other another nonfiction long one for uh, the space race. And a, yes, and uh, another alt history one. Right. Uh, so I I just have to make sure it's writing because I sometimes have conflicting ideas that come in at the same time. So I. Have to, sometimes do two at once, even if that doesn't make sense from a working perspective. But Well, I work uh, on multiple audiobooks at once, and uh, and I kind of enjoy that. I'll do, I'd say, I'd do, when I was working on yours, I think I had about six or seven on the go. So I would do a chapter of yours. I'd really enjoy being Hitler and Churchill and Roosevelt, and then I'd go and do another one, and the next one might be a romance book, you know. And, and so I liked my day to have a bit of variety in it. It's also a nice challenge as well to make, you know, give myself a challenge to change gear so uh, I can see how that would work because you could get a little bit close to e- too close to each one, I-, I find, and I like to have a bit of distance just like a listener would. Yeah. But uh, this one is great. The Two Presidents, it's by Joseph Burrow. 
Check it out now. Check the link in the, des the description. And Joseph, great to meet you. And uh, thank you for choosing me as your narrator for The Two Presidents. You're welcome. I, thank you. You did a great job, actually, as well. <laughs>